Hi, it's Katrina! Today we'll dive under the waves to look at some astonishing discoveries lurking beneath the waves. From a 17th century submarine to sunken treasures worth millions, and let's not forget the occasional underwater explosion. Be sure to subscribe and let's go! Sunken Temple Treasures Archaeologists have found even more treasure in the real-life Atlantis. The underwater city of Heraklion is likely the closest thing to Atlantis humanity can hope to find. It's located off the coast of Alexandria in Egypt, and if you've heard of the city before, keep watching because these discoveries are brand new! 1,000 years ago, Heraklion sank into the ocean as a result of a liquefaction event. The ground liquefied and the entire city was sucked into the sea. In the year 2000, Heraklion was discovered by marine archaeologist Frank Gaudio. I have to applaud him for his dedication because Frank has been hard at work studying the sunken city ever since, and the most recent round of excavations revealed some really bizarre stuff. Archaeologists salvaged gold jewelry, some silver dishes, and what may have been a wine-pouring device shaped like a duck. They also found a creepy ceramic hand poking out from the bottom of a sea like a drowned mannequin pleading for help. These artifacts were all found during a summer excavation of Heraklion's South Canal in 2023. This is where a great temple dedicated to Amun was found, the Egyptian god of the sun and the air. During the cataclysmic event that destroyed the city, huge blocks of stone from the temple collapsed. Frank and his team wanted to look through the remains for treasure from the temple, and they found it! Along with what I mentioned, archaeologists found ritual dishes that were used for libations for the gods. They also uncovered alabaster containers that had once held perfumes. These objects were used by Egyptian priests during rituals in the 5th century BC. Nobody knows what exactly went down during the rituals, only that they likely involved a lot of perfume, incense, and probably some razzle-dazzle. Heraklion was Egypt's main port city in the Mediterranean prior to Alexander the Great founding the city of Alexandria in 331 BC, and it remained important until it sank. The Lava Treasure This is the weirdest story involving sunken treasure that you're ever going to hear about. Keep listening, because it just gets crazier and crazier until the end! It all started 40 years ago with three men fishing for sea urchins in the Mediterranean Sea. The fishermen discovered a lost shipwreck and its sunken treasure in 1985 off the coast of Corsica. It's now 2024, and the trial of one of those fishermen recently got underway. The whole thing, from 1985 to now, is known as the Lava Treasure Saga. The man currently in court is Felix Bianca Maria. He was fishing with his twin brother and one of their friends when they uncovered, at the bare minimum, 100 extremely rare gold coins. It may have been closer to several hundred, though. Nobody has an exact number. The young men had gone into those waters in search of urchins and found an actual treasure. The coins date to the Roman era, to the 3rd century AD. They were in exceptional condition, stamped with the heads of Roman emperors. Isn't it every fisherman's dream to uncover a real sunken treasure? In this case, the dream became a nightmare. The issue was that the brothers never declared the treasure, which is illegal in France. It doesn't matter what you found, but if it's ancient and it was in the water, it belongs to the state. I know, it doesn't seem fair, but France doesn't believe in the finder's keeper's law. Felix, on the other hand, most definitely believes in that. In 1994, he was convicted of selling coins illegally and was given an 18-month suspended sentence. He was also ordered to pay over $15,000 in fines. Everyone thought that was it, but it wasn't. Felix's time in the court system was far from over. Once the authorities had clued into what was going on, they sent their own archaeologists to excavate the sunken site. Over 1,400 coins were found in the Gulf of Lava off France's southern coast. To this day, the coin hoard is considered one of the most important archaeological discoveries in French history. Almost all the coins came from the reign of Aurelian, who ruled Rome in 272 AD. There were so many coins found, all of which were in mint condition, that archaeologists think they were brand new. 
Experts believe the gold was in a galley, which was transporting a new shipment of freshly minted Roman coins. But it caught fire and sank. Archaeologists are still looking for the actual shipwreck. They've only ever been able to find the loosely scattered coins. And they say there could be thousands more that have yet to be discovered. In 2010, Felix was arrested by police at the Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris because he was carrying an extraordinary artifact on him. It wasn't a coin, but a rare golden plate from the Roman Empire. The artifact was worth an estimated $8 million. Imagine keeping a giant chunk of Roman gold in your house that could change your life if only you could sell the thing. But selling it was illegal. This must have been a huge dilemma for Felix. He had pried the golden plate out from under a rock on the seabed using a tank jack. But then he couldn't sell it because France said it was their piece of gold. When he finally did try to sell it after 25 years, he was caught with it at the airport and was arrested. In early 2024, just now in court, Felix changed his story. He said that he found the plate on land, not in the sea. You're allowed to keep artifacts you find on land in France, just not if you took them from underwater. Felix's trial is still unfolding, so I'll be sure to update you in the future. You're likely wondering what kind of plate, gold or otherwise, could be worth so much money. It's a huge golden plate that bears the head of Emperor Gallienus, who ruled Rome between 253 and 268 AD. It was once encrusted with diamonds and jewels, and a mysterious medallion that's currently missing. The plate probably isn't the only artifact that Felix and his pals have kept a secret. It's believed that they also uncovered a statue made of solid gold, though all three fishermen have denied it. To give you a better idea of why the gold pieces are such a big deal, each one is worth around $250,000. And that's per coin. Octopus Cities Scientists are pretty sure that octopuses may have come from space. They're the closest thing to aliens that we have living on the planet. They're extremely smart, have complex bodies and unusual genetics. And now, scientists have caught them building underwater cities. In Jervis Bay, off the coast of Australia, there are two communities of gloomy octopus. In both cities, octopuses have been spotted living in constructed burrows and homes. They've used shells to create houses, which isn't that unusual. The unusual part is that they've been documented building these houses as if they're creating suburban neighborhoods. Professor David Scheel, who recently led a research team to investigate the human-like underwater communities, said the behavior is a product of natural selection. Genius octopuses seem to be evolving before our very eyes. They created two fully functional artificial reefs populated by small, single-family homes. But some of the octopuses appear to not be paying their rent. Scientists witnessed some octopuses being evicted violently from their houses. So just how smart is an octopus? Smart enough to hunt using tools? Did you know that the blanket octopus will detach a jellyfish tentacle and use it as a venomous whip to hunt prey? And now they're building cities. It's probably just a matter of time before they take over the whole world. The Fomori Irish mythology is filled with so much more than leprechauns and fairies. The Fomori are some of the weirdest creatures from Irish folklore that nearly nobody has heard of. The old tales claim that the Fomori were freakish monsters that came from under the sea to wage war against the first human settlers on the island. Could these creatures have truly existed? Some believe that the Fomori were supernatural beings meant to represent the destructive powers of nature. Others have suggested they were real entities that rose from the depths of the sea to fight the Irish. The first mention of the Fomori, who are also called the Fomorians, is in texts from the 7th century. They were described as having the body of men and the heads of goats, and were also part cyclops and usually had one arm and one leg. That sounds horrifying and weirdly not dangerous. But would you be frightened of a goat man cyclops hobbling around on one leg? How do they balance themselves to attack? The one thing the stories have in common is that the Fomori were enemies of the first settlers and of the Tuatha de Danann. 
Now here's where things get a little Lovecraftian. The Tuatha de Danann were a supernatural race of deities who arrived in Ireland to become the first kings of men. In other words, they were gods from space, similar to the Sumerian stories of the Anunnaki. The Fomori were also a supernatural race, but they came from the water. Like the old Lovecraft tales of a war between aliens on Earth, the Fomori fought the Tuatha de Danann for supremacy. The Fomori lost and were pushed into the sea, where they are supposedly still waiting to fight another day. Could the Fomori be real mermaids and mermen? Let me know what you think in the comments. The Volcanic Boom Scientists have identified the largest underwater volcanic eruption in recorded history. It went down 7,300 years ago off the coast of Japan and caused widespread destruction. If such an eruption happened today, it could have apocalyptic consequences for modern society. Before this discovery, Mount Tambora in Indonesia was the record holder for ejecting the most rock in a single volcanic explosion in 1815. The eruption 7,300 years ago south of Japan's Kyushu Island ejected more than twice as much rock. The Kikai volcano has had at least three big eruptions in the last 140,000 years. Scientists already knew that the eruption happened, they just weren't sure how big it was. Now though, scientists of volcanology at the University of Clermont Auvergne reveal the full scale of it. They also think they learned what triggered it. To do this, it took an incredible amount of work. This wasn't a weekend project that you could turn in late on Monday afternoon. Researchers had to gather seismic data and create a huge map of the seabed surrounding the Kikai volcano. Then they drilled into the seabed using a remotely controlled submarine robot to collect sediment samples. With all the data put together, researchers had an astonishing conclusion on their hands. The eruption ejected roughly 110 cubic miles of material. 110 isn't a very big number, but keep in mind that these are cubic miles. To put that into perspective, the mega eruption spat out enough debris to fill Lake Tahoe to the brim twice. Scientists are calling it the largest eruption of the Holocene Epoch, which is also sometimes known as the Ice Age. Before this new data came out, the Minoan eruption of Santorini in Greece was thought of as the biggest Holocene eruption. But just wait until you hear these figures. The undersea volcano was nothing compared to the truly ancient eruptions of prehistoric Earth. It was like a pimple bursting compared to the cataclysmic boom of the Toba supervolcano 74,000 years ago on the island of Sumatra. It expelled about 1,200 cubic miles of pure magma. Creepy New Species the 100 new species that were just found on an underwater mountain are freakier than any bugs on land. Scientists have called the discovery mind-blowing, which it is if you can get over the creepy factor. So let's dig in. Scientists were using a remote-controlled robot to map an astonishing amount of seafloor. As they piloted their robotic submarine, hey, we've come a long way since Edmund's diving bell, they started spotting unusual critters. Over 10,000 feet beneath sea level, on the Salas y Gomez Ridge between Chile and Easter Island, new species reveal themselves. The creepy critters belong to all kinds of different classifications. Scientists spotted corals, sponges, amphipods, sea urchins, and something known as a squat lobster. According to the Schmidt Ocean Institute, at least 100 of the species have never been seen before by human eyes. There are oblong Dermechinus urchins that look like fuzzy pink bath sponges. They clump together on the underwater mountain like fuzzy balloons. Then there is the sea toad, which looks like it's made of crochet, but I assure you it's real. It's a fish with a fuzzy red body and a purple mouth that uses its fins to hop around like a frog. As scientists continue exploring the deepest corners of the ocean, expect to see more and more wacky marine creatures. So stay tuned for new discoveries. And now for a quick break because it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Bjorn Damrong and Keeper of Secrets. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Mysterious Stones 
I know you've heard of Stonehenge, but now you're going to hear about the Swiss Stonehenge found at the bottom of a lake. I'm not sure which one might be more impressive. Almost 20 feet deep in Lake Constance, which sits on the border of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, there are about 80,000 tons of rock. The rock was put there by humans as part of a building project 5,500 years ago. The incredible discovery was made by members of the Bavarian Society for Underwater Archaeology. It had already been known that there were submerged stone piles at the bottom of the lake, but these were the people who finally went down to solve the mystery. Sure enough, they found 200 artificial piles of stones. Considering the piles are underwater and extremely old, you'll have to understand that they are in rough shape. It's called the Swiss Stonehenge, but don't expect tall monoliths. Everything has been destroyed and reduced to rubble. But even in its crumbly state, scientists know that the Swiss Stonehenge was once huge. The sheer amount of stone suggests that it could have been one of the biggest monuments in prehistoric Europe. But what was it for? And the question you're undoubtedly asking is why is it at the bottom of a lake? The leader of the scientific team, Tobias Flederer, said that the monuments may have been platforms that were built by a cult obsessed with the dead. His theory is shared by other Swiss researchers. However, of course, the exact details are vague. So what did the cult worship? And are their bodies buried underneath the stone piles? Unfortunately, neither of these questions has been answered. But as for the underwater thing, that's surprisingly easy to explain. The stone piles are so big because they once stuck out of the water. Prehistoric people threw stones in piles until the piles were so large that they rose from the lake. They created platforms that could be used in ritual activities. You can think of them as huge stone lily pads. The Whale Song Whales love to sing. Songs sung by whales as they cruise majestically through the deep ocean are fascinating, sort of spooky and weirdly ethereal. While scientists know how some whales sing, others have proven a little more baffling. Did you know that whale songs were only discovered about 50 years ago? Did you also know that dolphins and killer whales have a vocal organ in their nose that produces sound? Researchers managed to get their hands on the body of a humpback whale after it died in 2018. They took the whole thing back to the lab to study in precise detail. That laboratory was probably really stinky. Cohen Elements from the University of Southern Denmark said that never before had such a level of analysis been done on a humpback whale. Scientists were able to poke through the stinky remains to uncover the truth of the whale's song. And what they found is biologically amazing. Every baleen whale has a larynx shaped much differently from other mammals. I won't get into the nitty gritty though, you're not here to listen to a whale dissection. But what I will say is that a baleen whale has a larynx shaped in such a way that they can breathe humongous amounts of air when they go to the surface. They also have specialized air sacs so they can recycle air while creating sounds. Whales have voice boxes just like humans have voice boxes, only theirs are far more bizarre. Scientists identified fatty cushions that vibrate when air is pushed out of their lungs, creating low-frequency sounds. These sounds allow whales to communicate over vast distances. The bottom line here is that scientists have finally figured out how whales talk to one another. Whales are the biggest animals in the world. They are incredibly intelligent, and now they have voice boxes. Scientists think they evolved the ability to speak to one another about 40 million years ago. Humans have to be in the same room pretty much to hear each other, but whales can use their voice boxes to talk to their friends across the emptiness of the ocean. Wouldn't you love to know what they talk about? The Ancient Submarine A mysterious object was found off the coast of Florida and you're not going to believe what it is. Not because it's unbelievable, but because for centuries, everybody thought the disc-shaped object was a cauldron. Only now have experts discovered the truth. This thing was a submarine from the 17th century. Let's start at the beginning. In 1980, a strange copper object was found off the coast of Florida. It was uncovered from the sand at the bottom of the sea near a wrecked Spanish treasure galleon. At first, researchers assumed that the large object was a cauldron for making things like fish stew. 
Sailors had a huge copper cauldron that would be filled with fish and whatever else was available. The chef would stir it all up and feed it to the hungry sailors. Since people didn't realize the importance of vitamins just yet, scurvy was a huge issue. Eating fish stew or dried meat every day isn't great for your overall health. You don't want to know what their teeth looked like. But this object likely wasn't a cauldron. Researchers now think it's a copper dome that was used as a primitive diving bell by treasure hunters 400 years ago. And if this is true, the object is one of the oldest diving apparatuses ever found. If you happen to be in the Florida neighborhood, you can check out the object for yourself at the Mel Fisher Museum where it's on display. I said earlier that it was found near a wrecked galleon. The galleon was the Santa Margarita, which sank in 1622, about 40 miles from Key West. You probably have a good idea of where this is all going. Diving equipment, a shipwreck, lost treasure, it all fits together nicely. Sean Kingsley, a maritime archaeologist, told Live Science that primitive submersibles could be used in shallow water. This strange copper object was likely part of one such vehicle. Though it wasn't really a vehicle, it was more of a giant bell. As the bell was submerged, a bubble of breathable air formed at its top, allowing divers to breathe. Imagine the Liberty Bell only significantly bigger. Now imagine inside the bell is a bench. Divers would have climbed into the bell, sat on the bench, and been slowly lowered into the deep. The bubble of air allowed them to breathe. And when the bell hit the bottom, they could scrounge around for treasure. It was a shoddy system that didn't work very well, though it was practically sound. One of the best designs was from Edmund Halley in 1690 the same guy who discovered Halley's Comet. When Edmund wasn't looking to the stars, he was designing the world's earliest submarines. The Klein Hollandia An anonymous shipwreck was found off the coast of Sussex that sent researchers on a quest to solve a 350-year-old mystery. It's a story of love, piracy, tragedy, and a little bit of bravery, too. The story starts with David Ronan, who for almost 20 years has operated his diving boat in Eastbourne, England. David initially operated the boat with his wife, Sylvia. They would find and then explore wrecks off the coast of the UK. Together, they helped complete the database of sunken vessels off the coast of Sussex. In 2019, Sylvia tragically passed away. Not wanting to stay idle, David continued searching for new wrecks. One site that was particularly interesting was initially identified in 2015. An unidentified lump was found in the seabed that looked like a partially buried ship. So, in 2019, David and his colleagues dove down to check it out. They found something very strange. There were five bronze cannons and eight iron cannons jutting out from the seabed. This wasn't an ordinary shipwreck. It appeared to be huge, and it was armed to the teeth. Since 2019, there have been over 450 dives to the site. David and other divers found the date of manufacture stamped on one of the guns. The gun was made in the year 1670 for the Admiralty of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. This narrowed down the identity of the shipwreck to the Klein Hollandia. The Klein Hollandia was built in 1654 and served in the Second Anglo-Dutch War. It had a very colorful service history. Through exhausting research, David learned that the ship was beaten senseless at the 1665 Battle of Lovestoft. After repairs, it was sent to fight at the Four Days Battle of 1666, one of the longest naval engagements in history. The Dutch fleet had 4,500 cannons, while the English fleet also had 4,500 cannons. No wonder it took so long for someone to win. They were pretty evenly matched. During the battle, the Klein Hollandia accidentally collided with another Dutch ship and caught fire. But the captain kept fighting as the boat blazed. He was definitely ready to go down with his ship. The crew managed to put the fire out, only for it to catch fire twice more during the fighting. The Klein Hollandia made it through the war only to fight the English again in 1672. This time, the boat sank and its captain was killed. The ship had been accompanying Dutch merchant vessels home from the Mediterranean when the English unexpectedly attacked. It was an ambush. The surprise attack during a time of peace, and so soon after the war had ended, made the Dutch extremely angry. 
Days later, the Third Anglo-Dutch War started, but the Klein Hollandia was already at the bottom of the sea. Uncovering the ship's identity was exciting for David, though he wished his wife Sylvia had been alive to share the moment with him. Once he and the others understood the historical context of the boat, it started to make sense why they kept finding human bones in the debris. The Evil Eye David Shalom is a lifeguard in Israel who made a discovery of epic proportions. He was snorkeling at Pomahim Beach when he spotted something that looked interesting on the seabed. He dived down to get it, then went to the beach to check out his new treasure. It looked like a small white disc made of marble. David had no idea what it was. This small white disc turned out to be magic. It was used 2,500 years ago by sailors to protect themselves from evil spells. All David wanted was to go for a snorkel, and he found an artifact straight out of the ancient Israeli version of Harry Potter. David got a hold of the Israel Antiquities Authority after he found the mysterious disc. They were the ones who identified the artifact as a talisman called an ophthalmoi. It's flat on one side and curved on the other, with concentric circles painted around a hole in the middle. This was done on purpose for the disc to look like an eyeball. But why an eyeball? Well, it's because in the 5th century BC, when this relic was made, people were terrified of the evil eye. People have lived in fear of the evil eye for at least 5,000 years. Even today, it's seen as a malevolent force of nefarious energy. The ancient superstition was simple. People were under the impression that certain parties could curse an individual by giving them a supernatural glare. Surely somebody is giving you the stink eye before. Or maybe you're the giver of the stink eye. The evil eye was the same thing, but with a pinch of magic. Victims were often unaware that someone had cursed them, perhaps glaring at them menacingly from across a marketplace. To ensure they weren't being cursed, people wore amulets of protection. It was believed that special amulets and talismans could negate the negative effects of the evil eye. The circular disc pulled out of the Mediterranean Sea by our friend David was nailed to a ship's bow. It was supposed to protect the whole ship against the evil eye and to act as a navigational aid. It would have been joined by a second talisman nailed to the bow, and together the marble discs acted as an extra pair of eyes looking out for danger. Megalodon Teeth If you could have a necklace made from the teeth of any animal, which animal would you choose? Would it be a necklace made of T-Rex teeth? Or would you rather have a necklace made of fearsome Megalodon teeth? If you do enough diving in Mexico, you could probably fashion a Megalodon tooth necklace in no time. Divers in Mexico recently discovered prehistoric teeth in a flooded cave. That's teeth, plural, as in a whole ton of Megalodon teeth. They were found in a weird place, one where you wouldn't expect to find the chompers from a ferocious shark that lived 3.6 million years ago and grew to be 50 feet long. The teeth were uncovered by Kay Zapata, a spillologist and photographer. Kay was diving in the newly discovered Cholul Cenote, a natural sinkhole that was identified in 2019. This thing is like a watery portal to hell. It goes down over 1,200 feet into sheer blackness. You wouldn't want to drop your car keys here. Divers have to have some real gumption to descend into what feels like a bottomless pit or like a huge well. Deep inside the cenote, Kay and another diver gathered 15 various shark teeth. They also found some human bones. Spooky. Most of the teeth belong to the megalodon. Others are from the saw shark and the mackerel shark. All the teeth are between 2.5 and 5 million years old. But how did the sharks get into the cenote? And why were all their teeth found in a clump at the bottom? And what about the human bones? I have so many questions. The most reliable explanation is that the Cholul Cenote was once connected to the ocean. Sharks may have swum into it and then got stuck and perished. There doesn't seem to be any other logical reason for why so many shark teeth ended up in the same spot. As for the human bones, they could easily be the remains of sacrifice victims from the Maya Empire. Mu, Egypt, and the Popol Vuh The land of Mu was a humongous continent that existed from 50,000 until 12,000 years ago in the Atlantic Ocean. It stretched from the borders of Hawaii to Easter Island and all the way to Micronesia in the west. 
Upon this landmass was an advanced civilization of people known as the Nakal. You might think they were the Atlanteans, but they were a completely separate society. They had huge cities spread across the continent and smaller colonies in other parts of the world. In total, there were about 64 million people on Mu. Is this real history or nothing but fantasy? I'm going to leave the decision making up to you. I'm just here to tell you about the myth and about some claims involving the Maya, the Egyptians, and the Nakal. At the end of the Ice Age, at the same time the Bible says a flood swept across the world, disaster struck Mu. They were hit by a flood and the entire continent sank into the ocean. Not just a little bit into the ocean, but way down to the depths of the sea, where scientists have been hopeless at studying it. Again, keep in mind that this is all according to legend without any kind of scientific backing. The first recorded mention of the land of Mu didn't appear until the 1800s. A British-American travel writer by the name of Augustus Le Plongeon mentioned it in a book. He claimed that civilizations such as Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica came from Nakal refugees. When Mu sank into the ocean, the survivors spread across the world. They landed in all the different corners of the globe and started civilization fresh. This could explain why so many ancient cultures were obsessed with similar things. Ancient civilizations all had sun deities that they worshipped. They all liked building pyramids, and many of them had nearly identical burial practices as well. This could be attributed to the fact that they all came from one root civilization that sank into the sea. Augustus got his ideas after investigating ruins in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. He supposedly translated copies of the ancient Mayan book called the Popo Vu, which revealed that the Mayans were older than accepted by mainstream scientists. Augustus also believed that Egypt was founded by Queen Mu, who had been a refugee of the lost continent. Does any of this sound convincing yet? I have a bit more you'll need to hear about before making your ultimate decision. After Augustus came a Scottish writer named James Churchward, who published several books in the early 1900s. He claimed that while serving as a soldier in India, he became friends with a mysterious temple priest. The temple priest revealed to him clay tablets that were written in a baffling language. The language was a mix between ancient Mayan and an ancient Indian language called Naga. Only the temple priest was able to read the tablets. They supposedly mentioned a lost and forgotten land called Mu. But is all this just a coincidence? The mysterious tablets also claimed that Mu was destroyed in a single night following a series of devastating explosions. James argued that Mu had been made of granite. Over thousands of years, honeycomb-like caves had formed under the surface. The caves slowly filled with explosive gases until they blew apart, shattering Mu and causing it to sink. Nobody knows where these tablets are anymore. For all anyone knows, they may have never existed at all, and the whole story could be a fabrication. There also hasn't been any evidence of the lost continent of Mu discovered at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. What do you think? Is Mu real? Could all the people of the world have come from a single root civilization? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching and be sure to hit that subscribe button and stick around for more awesome content. Underwater Cave of Skeletons Researchers discovered what they believe to be one of the oldest skeletons in all the Americas in an underwater cave. This person was laid to rest over 10,000 years ago in a strange ritual performed by ancient people who came way before the Maya. They took the body down into the darkness of the cave before it filled with water and buried him. Humans had only been in the Americas for about 3,000 years before that. The exploration team found the skeleton in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Although this may have been a lush jungle when the Maya took over the region, Region, it was more of a desert 10,000 years ago. The people who lived here would have differed vastly from those who came after. This was not the pre-Columbian Mexico most people think about. The cave's opening was discovered in 2006, then explored by German cave divers. They passed through more than 1,800 feet of dark tunnels before they accidentally came upon the remains of a person from the Ice Age. The researchers brought the bones back to the surface by using sealable bags filled with cave water. For the next three years, researchers 
researchers from the Desert Museum in Saltillo studied the bones to understand them better, but they have learned little about the person so far. They say it was probably a male and that he died at a young age. They also believe that almost immediately after his death, the cave filled with water. 5 million pieces of Lego there are pieces of Lego that show up on beaches all over the world. It would be pretty difficult to go searching for them since you never know where they're going to end up. But what I can tell you is that there are at least 5 million pieces of Lego currently lost at sea and that one woman has spent 25 years looking for them. Are you a big Lego fan? Let me know in the comments! It all started in February 1997 when a cargo ship lost its freight. The ship had set sail from Rotterdam and was about 20 miles from the coast of Cornwall when a monster wave hit. The wave tilted the ship 60 degrees in one direction and then 40 degrees in the other. This sent the ship's 62 shipping containers splashing into the ocean. One of those containers had 5 million pieces of Legos in it. To make it even weirder, most of the Lego was sea-themed. They found approximately 4,756,940 pieces related to seafaring adventures. Once the container hit the ground, it burst and released all the Lego. I'm talking about small yellow life jackets, green plastic seagrass, tiny spear guns, and scuba tanks. The works all lost at sea. Beachcomber Tracy Williams has spent 25 years tracking the lost Lego pieces. She used to spend nights with her children combing the beaches near her home, looking for lost plastic sea dragons. They found pieces as far away as Texas and Australia. The Underwater Soldier Researchers discovered the skeleton of a soldier from the 16th century during a routine underwater bridge inspection in the European country of Lithuania. He must have fallen into Lake Asveja 500 years ago, and nobody bothered to get him out. They discovered him wearing his sword at his side, still strapped in his boots. The shifting sediment had buried him. The man's remains were 30 feet beneath the surface under a huge layer of silt and sand. According to archaeologist Elena Prankinate, the skeleton became buried because of currents gradually covering covering the body with more and more sand over the centuries. This is how things get lost. Dust and sand move around, dirt gets piled on stuff, and boom! 1,000 years later, an entire buried city is 30 feet under the mud. Divers could extract the bones and the artifacts, but nobody knows too much about this man yet. They know he was a man, but they don't know what killed him. The archaeologists uncovered two knives along with his iron sword, a leather belt, and a buckle that may help determine his military role. Back in the 1500s, it was the house of Jagiel that ruled the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. There was a huge castle constructed in 1412 near this lake on a piece of land that was once an island. It protected the city of Vilnius from attack. Judging by the important look of the belt buckle, the time of death, and that they found him in the water, it's safe to say the soldier may have been protecting an earlier bridge or some other gateway to the castle. He was likely there to protect whichever royals were staying in the castle. Then somehow he wound up fully clothed and dead in the lake. The Siberian sea devil. There have been reports of a devil-like sea monster living in Siberia's Lake Labinkir ever since the 19th century. The legends have intrigued scientists who have heard plenty of stories but have never actually seen the monster. This lake is one of the most inaccessible in the world, right in the middle of the coldest region in Russia. That's made it pretty hard to explore. But recently, a team completed a deep dive here under its icy surface, reaching a depth of over 150 feet in freezing cold temperatures. Their goal was to see what mysteries they could find at the bottom of the lake. Sadly, the divers never discovered a monster. What they saw swimming under the frozen surface of the lake was a dogfish. Throughout the entire operation, divers from Russia's most prestigious organizations found nothing except dogfish. They were pretty big, about six feet and frightening looking, but not devils and not monsters. Remains of a sea monster. Something strange happened when a diver who worked in the oil and gas industry discovered the skeleton of a sea monster lying on the bottom of the ocean. The story is a little weird. It comes from Deborah Hatswell, someone who calls herself a paranormal researcher. Deborah says that in 2017, she received footage from the diver in the oil and gas industry showing him using a remotely operated vehicle 3,000 feet below the surface. In the footage, we can see the robot inspecting what we can only describe as the vertebral column of a gigantic beast. It's enormous, measuring roughly 98 feet long. And that's only the vertebrae, not the tail or the flippers or whatever other kind of squishy parts the creature may have had. The dimensions of the skeleton don't fit with any living creature known to science. 
The person who took the footage didn't know what to do with it, so he put it online and Deborah got a hold of it. The story was never picked up by any mainstream paleontologists or other experts, and it's largely considered a hoax. It's quite disappointing because nobody knows if it's real, if there was a dragon skeleton on the bottom of the ocean, or if they filmed this in somebody's fish tank. Do you think the bones of the mysterious creature could be real? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about strange and mysterious discoveries. An Ancient Hunting Bow Someone discovered an ancient hunting bow underwater from 460 years ago in Lake Clark National Park, Alaska. They made it between 1506 and 1660, but nobody can quite figure out where it came from. They found the antique weapon on Denaina Islands, an ancient indigenous people whose ancestral homelands take up large parts of South and Central Alaska. But what's bizarre is that the initial analysis of the bow shows it wasn't of Denaina origin, but appears to more closely resemble Alutik style an indigenous people from another area. Right now, the bow is being investigated by the Park Service's Regional Curatorial Center in Anchorage, with help from archaeologists and indigenous experts. Maybe the bow was used in a trade between two ancient indigenous groups, or they had taken it after some epic battle in the snow and ice. Then it ended up at the bottom of a lake. Missing Ship in Lake Superior A shipwreck that has been missing for 130 years was just discovered in 2022 at the bottom of Lake Superior. The ship is called the Atlanta, and they thought it to have been gone forever. Yet according to the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society, they have identified it 30 miles from Deer Park in Michigan, at a murky depth of 650 feet. The Historical Society discovered the 172-foot schooner barge using newly developed sonic technology. They mapped over 2,500 miles of Lake Superior in the summer of 2021, and this was what ultimately led them to the location of the sunken ship. As for when the ship sank, that was back on May 4, 1891. The Atlanta was carrying a load of coal during a storm when it got caught in a gale. The ship's sail snapped, the crew unloaded into a lifeboat, and the ship was gone. Ever since, nobody thought they would ever find it again. Everyone thought the ship was deep beneath the sediment on the bottom of the lake. But now that they have found it, researchers are amazed to see it's in excellent condition. 130 years in the cold water of Lake Superior has kept the ship in almost the same shape shape as when it sank. It's practically a time capsule, with all the artifacts left behind by the crew still sitting neatly on the shelves. Rose-shaped coral reef Scientists recently found a new coral reef off the coast of Tahiti in French Polynesia. It's one of the biggest new coral reefs and is extraordinarily unique because it's shaped like a rose. French photographer Alexis Rosenfield discovered it at a depth of between 90 and 180 feet, with help from the One Ocean Campaign. The reason this is so important is that coral reefs are being bleached at an alarming rate. The bleaching is death for a coral reef, which leads to a break in the food chain and a cascading effect of marine destruction. But this rose-shaped coral reef appears to have been completely unaffected by any of the bleaching events that have destroyed many other coral reefs. It looks like it's in pristine condition, which is excellent news. It's also strange because they can find the vast majority of coral reefs at only shallow depths of up to 75 feet. It's a little unusual that they have found a coral reef at nearly double that depth and in a much darker part of the ocean. Whatever it means, scientists don't quite know, but it appears to be good news for the ocean, or at least this area. A sunken UFO Researchers have discovered an unidentified flying object at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Of course, it's not an unidentified flying object since it's submerged. It's more like an unidentified sunken object, a USO. But whatever you want to call it, people seem to believe it is an alien spaceship. An amateur investigator discovered the alleged sunken spaceship. He was poking around on Google Earth when he came across a questionable dark circle off the coast of Peru. The object appears to be nearly five miles wide and sitting right at the bottom of the ocean, weirdly close to the Nazca Lines in Peru. It's the same conspiracy theorists who think extraterrestrial beings, rather than the ancient people who lived in the Peruvian desert, made the Nazca Lines. The presence of an alien spaceship just off the coast bolsters these ideas. But of course, there is no solid proof that we're talking about an extraterrestrial ship. It does kind of look like Hollywood's idea of a UFO, but it also looks like a rock. Until a team of scientists can get down to the bottom of the sea and dig the shape out, we'll never know the truth. The Wolverine Fish 
scientists have discovered a new freshwater species of fish. It's fascinating for one main reason. It has claws like Wolverine from X-Men. They have even given it the name the Wolverine Fish. It was discovered in 2021, along with over 200 additional species of freshwater fish. In case you didn't know already, scientists identify lots of new species every year. Many of them are already going extinct, and some are totally freaky. The Wolverine Fish is a type of pleco catfish. It has spikes on the ends of its little paws that it uses as powerful weapons. On the side of its face, right under its eyeballs, are what look like small hands that would make a T-Rex feel long-armed, and at the ends of the hands are three fearsome spiky claws. The fish lives in the Brazilian river of Rio Xingu, and they have never found it anywhere else. It uses its claws as a defense mechanism when other creatures harass it. It's able to push claws out of its skin to slash its enemies, just like Wolverine from the comic books. The Lost Highway to Atlantis some people think Atlantis, if it ever really existed, is located in the Mediterranean. But there is another train of thought that says the lost city of Atlantis is in the Caribbean. And believe it or not, there is actually physical evidence to back up this claim. A road on the bottom of the ocean has been discovered with paving stones of huge rectangular blocks. The road appears to be a lost underwater highway to what was once a great city. Interestingly enough, in the 1930s, American mysticist Edgar Cayce predicted that Atlantis is located in the Atlantic Ocean, and that parts of Atlantis would rise again off the east coast of North America. Cayce talked quite a lot about Atlantis over a 20-year span and made numerous claims about it, including that it was an ultra-advanced society that was far ahead of modern humans, and that its last remnants sunk into the Atlantic Ocean 10,000 years ago. He also believed that Atlantis was a series of islands that occupied a combined area as big as Eurasia. Before Atlantis disappeared, he said that there was a mass exodus of residents from the island who fled to Egypt, meaning some Atlanteans actually survived, if you believe Casey's version of events. A diver discovered a submerged structure 18 feet underwater in the Bahamas in 1968, right around the year Casey had said, near the island of Bimini. This limestone rock formation appears to be a road or part of some other man-made structure and is now known as Bimini Road. Naturally, because of Casey's premonition, some people believe that the Bimini Road or the Bimini Wall either was part of Atlantis or led there. You have to admit that's a pretty good call on Casey's part, whether it's Atlantis or not. There isn't actually any trace of Atlantis at the end of the road, but it could be hidden under centuries of sediment. It might also be that the legendary city was destroyed beyond recognition during an earthquake or a flood, or it may never have existed at all. Lost Japanese Warplane Tetsuro Hayashi is the 74-year-old dive shop operator who discovered the wreckage of a mysterious Japanese warplane. He found it off the coast of Kyushu. It was a total fluke of a discovery, but one so interesting and important that the Japanese welfare ministry became involved. These are the people in charge of collecting the remains of dead Japanese soldiers. Because the warplane was used by the Imperial Japanese Navy in World War II, it's believed to hold at least some physical remains of the pilots who went down with their plane. The central government approved a search for human remains back in June. The wreckage is sitting at a depth of about 60 feet, only 900 feet from the northern tip of the island. The aircraft is a Type 97 attack bomber a three-seater plane used in the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. These airplanes were also used in kamikaze attacks in the Pacific War. Dive teams haven't found any bodies just yet, but they are looking. The issue is that much of the wreck has been covered by sand. They have to dig through the sand of the seabed with their hands looking for artifacts, bones, and anything else. It's possible after all of this time that there will be little left to discover but the sea is always revealing new mysteries. The Sunken Town of Pablo Petri The town of Pablo Petri can be found at the bottom of the sea floor off the coast of southern Greece. In 1904, the submerged remains were first identified by a geologist named Folkion Negris. It wasn't until 1967 that Nicholas Fleming from the University of Cambridge took a team of archaeologists to the location and discovered the real scale of the site. Just 60 feet from the coastline, there lies the remains of the Mycenaean town, measuring seven acres in size. Modern excavations have revealed a city of ridiculous proportions. 
It was occupied as early as 3500 BC, with some of its stone walls still standing. Archaeologists have found the foundations of streets, the remains of courtyards, houses, as well as graves from the Bronze Age covered in sea muck. The discovery of a shocking number of looms and loom weights suggests the town boomed thanks to a textile industry. And because of its position on the coast, it was also probably a major trading post. Sadly for the residents of the city, it was that advantageous position on the coast that led to it being sucked into the sea. Geologists theorize the town submerged as a result of regional faulting. Tectonic activity led to convergence and subduction, and so the town fell beneath sea level. It was submerged by several feet of water before the time of the Romans, and as a result, was completely abandoned. Soviet Submarine Wreckage In February of 1968, a Soviet submarine left its port in Russia. Its mission was to vanish beneath the water off the west coast of the United States, armed with three nuclear missiles. Each of these missiles was 65 times more dangerous and explosive than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Two weeks into its mission, something went wrong. The crew missed a scheduled transmission and all contact was lost. The submarine wasn't found again until August of that same year, three miles beneath the surface of the ocean. We still don't know exactly what happened to it. What we do know is that the Americans realized the Soviets were looking for something after the sub went missing in 68. The US used their own acoustic technology to find out where it could be. They marked it, but didn't immediately bother going down to try and recover it. Considering how deep the submarine sank, it seemed like a lot of work. But they did try to get it about a decade later. The attempt was in 1974 on the ship Glomar Explorer. The ship, disguised as a deep-sea mining vessel but operated by the CIA, trying to use a hydraulic claw to lift the submarine and the nuclear missiles it was carrying off the floor of the ocean. It was a massive failure. The claw managed to get a single section off the seabed, but then it broke. The claw cracked, the mission had to be abandoned, and the submarine is still there. In fact, the mysteriously destroyed submarine and its weaponized cargo are both still on the bottom of the ocean kind of makes you wonder just how many other Soviet or other submarines with nuclear capabilities are lost deep down in the ocean. Underwater Mayan Salt Kitchen The ancient Maya of Mexico and Guatemala are famous for a lot of things, from amazing architecture to a captivating culture. But they are also famous for maintaining a consistent supply of salt up until their disappearance a thousand years ago. Researchers have been struggling to figure out how people living deep in the jungle were able to get so much salt. And as it turns out, it's because the coastal Mayans had salt kitchens. They traded the salt that they mined from the salt flats on the Yucatan coast to those in the jungle. This realization was thanks to a research team who discovered some of these salt kitchens hidden underwater off the coast of Belize. In the oxygen-free sediment, they found the remains of Maya dwellings and the factories where they boiled brine in pots to create salt. This salt was shipped all over the kingdom and used in everyday cooking. The practice dates back roughly 2,500 years. Studying these submerged kitchens was not easy. Researchers had to take whatever small samples they could find from the bottom of the ocean and ship them back to their laboratory. The samples consisted primarily of wooden pieces from buildings and pottery shards. They are now confident there were at least 10 salt kitchens in this one coastal area, along with residences for the workers who lived there full time. But when sea levels started to rise and the coastal cities began flooding, the kitchens were abandoned. This was sometime around the year 900, at the very end of the Mayan civilization. The Mary Rose the Mary Rose was King Henry VIII's favorite warship, but during an epic battle with the French in 1545, it sank. The ship then spent the next few centuries rotting at the bottom of the sea. It sat on the floor of the English Channel until it was brought to the surface in 1982. When King Henry ordered the construction of the ship, he was only 19 years old. He'd come into power the year before. At the time, the Mary Rose was the most technologically advanced warship on the planet. It could carry eight huge guns and weighed somewhere around 600 tons. It sailed in two wars against the French before it capsized in battle for unknown reasons. The crew of about 500 went down with the ship. The Mary Rose was discovered in 1971. 
For the next 10 years, over 500 divers and researchers helped excavate the vessel. They removed each artifact one piece at a time through a painstaking process. Then, in 1982, the hull of the ship was raised to the surface. Half of it was still perfectly intact. Experts treated the ship in polythylene glycol to stabilize it and then brought it to Portsmouth in the UK, where it is still on display right now. Can you believe that it survived all this time? Mysterious Wooden Stakes Historians have been baffled by the collection of strange wooden stakes in the shallow water off the coast of Vancouver Island in Canada. Spread out along the intertidal zone in the Comox estuary, over 150,000 sticks can be seen during low tide. Nobody has ever been sure what these things are, as they've just kind of always been around. But now, archaeologists finally think they have the answer. They say these sticks are actually the remains of hundreds of ancient fishing traps left behind by the First Nations people of Canada 1,300 years ago. The fishing traps were probably used up until the last century, but during their peak, before the Europeans came and took over the land, the fishing traps provided food for somewhere around 12,000 Comox people in the Comox Valley. Nobody could figure out what they were because they've been gradually destroyed by the comings and goings of the tide. Most of the time, they are submerged underwater. But once archaeologists figured out the sticks were used as fishing traps, it was easy to connect the dots. When the tide came up, fish would swim into an opening, which led them inside of a trap with lattice panels connected from post to post. When the tide receded, the fish got stranded and couldn't get out. But the water never went out enough that the fish died. This allowed the traps to act as holding ponds to keep the fish alive and fresh for eating. Submerged City of Dwarka Dwarka is India's version of Atlantis. The city is said to be one of the seven great holy pilgrimage centers of India, except that nobody's ever seen it. Legend says the city was built by the ancient kingdom of Krishna at the meeting of the Gomti River and the Arabian Sea. But after Lord Krishna's death, the city sank into the Arabian Sea and vanished forever. That's how the legend goes, but now it's time to look at reality. For the last 50 years, archaeologists have been searching for any piece of evidence that the sunken city exists. And believe it or not, they've actually found a lot of stuff off the coast. They've found old stone blocks, submerged pillars, hundreds of artifacts strewn across the sea floor, and suggestions of a great city wall. The problem is that nobody can say exactly what any of these things belong to. Archaeologists are still excavating the bottom of the sea in hopes of finding the foundation of a city, or even proof of a large settlement. But so far, all they are finding are bits and pieces of structures that could have come from anywhere. The search is still on for more proof of the lost city of Dwarka. The White Ship A man named Lord Charles Spencer was exploring the shallow waters off the coast of France when he came across the remains of an ancient longboat. The vessel comes from the 12th century and is now called the White Ship. It sank near Normandy on November 25, 1120. At the time, it was one of the biggest and fastest ships in the world. But when it sank, it killed just about every single crew member. One man survived and 299 died. Among the dead was William Adeline, the grandson of William the Conqueror. The sinking of the White Ship was such a huge disaster that it left King Henry I without a male heir to take his throne. This threw the English monarchy into chaos as they scrambled to figure out what would happen to the royal line. This was one of the most dramatic sinkings in English history. It completely disrupted the monarchy, ruined King Henry I's dream of his son taking the throne, and was just generally terrible. But what's really interesting is that the man who found it, Charles Spencer, is Princess Diana's brother. He was part of the diving expedition that went down specifically to recover the white ship. It's in shockingly good shape for a wreckage that's nearly 1,000 years old. Submerged Stonehenge At the bottom of Lake Michigan, of all places, researchers discovered a series of stone circles. These stone circles have been compared to Stonehenge in England, except they are located right in the middle of the Great Lakes region. Who made the stone circles and why has become something of a mystery. The earliest humans who inhabited the Great Lakes, as far as historians know, were the Hopewell. They were a culture of Native Americans who vanished around the year 800, just a century or two before the Maya were gone. After them, the late woodland Native Americans made this area their home. 
but researchers still don't know which culture built the stone circle, or if it was a different group entirely. In fact, figuring out who built the Lake Michigan stone circle has proved even more difficult than figuring out who built Stonehenge. In the U.S., we are dealing with a submerged stone circle at the bottom of a lake, a lake where countless prehistoric tribes came and went over the millennia. The one thing that helps is knowing the geological history of the region. Scientists are fairly sure that 10,500 years ago, the water level of the lake was low enough that somebody could have built something on the bottom. 3,500 years later, the lake filled back up. This means at some point during the lake being an empty crater, somebody went in and put up a bunch of stones. They probably abandoned the area when the water levels rose and forced them out. Thanks for watching. What's your favorite underwater city or submerged ruin? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button and come back soon. See you later. Bye.